morning, everyone. And uh, a reminder there, timely, that uh, we are recording this so uh, others uh, and ourselves can uh, um, view, this, uh, view this later. Um, welcome to uh, our Breaking Down Barriers to Building Science uh, presentation number seven of the year. Um, this one uh, being on daylighting, demystifying the metrics. Um, uh, we're happy to, uh, to have uh, all of you joining us this evening. And as you may see also, there's a poll that uh, is running uh, as a pop-up window, um, which we also wanted to use to give feedback to our uh, presenters as we, uh, as we get started. Um, so as, as many of you know who've joined us before, this is uh, the seventh in this year's series on building science. Uh, we're going to run for a few more uh, talks on this on this uh, series. Uh, and this follows um, on some series that we uh, started uh, last year. In fact, even I think going back to the fall of, of 2019 when we were meeting in person around a, a table um, back, back in the day. So um, again, the reason we are we started this series of talks and started these uh, these meetings was to um, was to highlight the uh, the AIA 2030 commitment and provide folks um, with with resources and uh, to um, help them you know get signed up, learn more about the 2030 commitment, um, get their firm signed up. And use it as a tool towards um, towards achieving the target of the uh, of carbon neutral by 2030, which is um, obviously you know very important uh, um, target for all of us to, to strive for as as we you know, meet about uh, almost daily. So um, a couple of the things that uh, we want to um, just emphasize: there's not a lot of it, the, this is the 2030 commitment is not complicated. It it's quite quick to report uh, projects. Um, we, among, amongst this committee, please feel free to reach out. Uh, we're all happy to, to uh, serve as a resource um, on signing up. Uh, there's, um, and, and you'll find that as you report, you're gonna learn a lot about, about your present work and it'll give you input on how to um, to kind of re to use us to reevaluate your process. So the steps are quite simple. You sign the commitment letter, you develop a sustainability action plan, and there are multiple uh, examples and guides uh, offered to do that. Um, you report all of your projects in the DDX da database, which is a very a fairly quick process, it can be as little as 15 minutes per project. Um, Start to pursue the ta the targets, and then see how you're doing, and try to try to do better the next time. And I think you'll find that uh, from our experience, um, every year you're going to learn more about the process and and uh, feed that information back into your into your projects uh, at earlier phases. Again, uh, earlier this year, the AIA released uh, creating a sustainability action plan that works some uh, new guidance on developing a sustainability action plan for firms. And also, uh, we do need to update this, but the AI Affiliate Code now has a YouTube page that we've uh, that we posted these videos on. We'll get this uh, updated um, for, for the next talk, I guess. And, um, you know, and, and again, we have past talks uh, recorded that we've started recording since uh, we went virtual last spring. So uh, tonight's talk, it picks up on uh, last month's talk on solar, uh, solar analysis. And now we're getting into the building and talking about daylighting and demystify demystifying the metrics. And we're gonna focus on how light is measured and how it is simulated, compare, compare and contrast light levels required to support different building programs, we focus on the particulars of each type of building program, um, and dis discuss factors that uh, contribute to uh, erroneous daylight measurements, and identify some tools. And we're going to focus on on what you can do when uh, with uh, with daylighting in the process. So in the meantime, I want to make sure that everybody's filling out the poll. Um, I think we'll end it um, as we as we get after we introduce the speakers, as we get to introducing the speakers and and into the talk. So, yeah. Okay. 
So um, we'll, we're going to start tonight with a little bit of a Daylight 101, just you know, remind everybody of some of the basics, um, kind of set a foundation for the talk, get into the metrics, and then we're going to pre pre present some projects uh, that provide uh, good case study examples um, in, in action for, uh, for everyone to, uh, to use as, as guidance. So again, our presenters tonight are Ksenia Pinaskina uh, with Atelier, T Atelier 10. Um, she presented uh, with us uh, last month, uh, so many of you are familiar with her. And we're also happy to have uh, Dan Weissman join us from Lam, Lam Labs uh, in, uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And Dan is an architect and now really working as a lighting designer. And, uh, and does a lot of this uh, as a part of his regular, regular practice. So I think now would be a good time for me to, to end the polling and see where, we're, see where we're at, give some feedback to our, uh, to our presenters. So uh, we have these couple of quick questions um, in this poll. Does your office perform daylighting simulation on projects? Uh, it looks like um, about 41% uh, said yes and 36% no. And there we go. And uh, 20 and 23 percent sometimes. So it's kind of an even split um, of, of yes and no and uh, and, and maybe. Um, so then, uh, who performs the uh, the simulations? Uh, it it seems like uh, this is actually often done in house, which is uh, encouraging, but uh, also by lighting designers about a third of the time, uh, in house two thirds of the time and uh, engineers, uh, I guess there's some overlap here. I don't think these numbers add up to 100%, but uh, engineers, 14% uh, and other 24%. And in terms of purpose, uh, code compliance, obviously um, is an important one, uh, using, using this as feedback for facade design. And I assume the high performance building focuses on um, on you know, uh, rating systems and and uh, and also uh, in mo modeling and evaluations, and then uh, some some use it for just standard uh, design practice. And again, on the tools, a pretty good split. Um, seems that Autodesk Insight, Climate Studio, and Ladybug are are among the most used. Um, and then actually, the most common response was not sure what. Uh, what we're using for that. So um, I think with that, I, I will uh, plan to turn this over to our team. I hope that maybe there's some useful feedback there for you, Dan and Ksenia, to, uh, to kind of get into your talks. And um, I will advance the slides, but if, um, I don't, if you guys have your own presentations, we can also transfer the sharing as well. So um, just, just let me know. So. We're going to get into the Daylighting 101 and the introduction uh, to the metrics. And if you'd like me to just advance the slides too, I can do that. Um, well, maybe I can start sharing. It, it's okay. the same slide deck, but I think it will be sure. easier than saying next slide. Okay. Time. <laughs> um, We can start with daylight one one. With hey, Cassinia, we're having trouble hearing you. Yeah, it's just yeah. very, very faint. I think maybe we let Josh present and then um, yeah. advance the slides because it was working then. <laughs> Let's, right. do that. Let's see if that works better. Or I can. I remember last time we were like hitting mute and unmute, mute. Yeah. Unmute. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's let's go. All right, to next slide. Um, so basically, let's start the, the question: How do you find the 
Slide. <laughs> Do we mean a space that is um, that has floor to ceiling windows that's supposed to show up in the next slide and high reflective materials and three hundred bucks on on all your workstation or if we go into the next slide, uh, if we mean the daylight design. Um, and how the daylight makes you feel in a space and here, or as you can see on the next slide as well. Um, and let's go skip to the next one right away. Or do we mean the lighting comfort? Comfort. Um, the well-lit design. And the answer is, we mean all of it. The daylight is very complex. Um, Thing in a sustainability that um, really have to be balanced, right? So we want to balance this great views to, to the outdoors. So we want to balance the daylight that penetrates deep into the space and provides a lot of quality daylight that doesn't create the glare on a perimeter. So no one in office has to do all these things that people do in the right in here um, or as in our office. Um, for example, at 1 p.m., we have this big whole glass building right in front of us reflect the daylight right in our faces. So we'll bring up our sunglasses and hats um, 1 to 2 p.m. Um, so all that has to be balanced to create a well-lit, comfortable, visually comfortable space that make sense for the certain program that makes sense for the certain um, activities that the occupants are going to be doing in there. And if we go to the next slide, there are some benchmarks and guidelines that are supposed to help the design team achieve that. Um, as I said, daylight is a quite complex thing. So um, as great as lead and well are, it's not always the perfect way to benchmark the daylight. It, you can have a great daylight if you not achieve all the three points under lead before or 4.1, well, uh, you may have a great daylight feature that you really thought about daylight design and you may design it to the way that you don't have any glare and you have the great daylight in the spaces that you want to, but it doesn't meet lead. So it's not the perfect system, but it's a guidance anyway, and it's um, it's always good to reference it. And I wanted to provide a little bit of um, intro to these three as well, just because they got so ingrained into the daylight and daylight analysis. And I think it's important to understand what exactly is happening in there. So um, what's not shown in here, but as you may remember, at lead V3, we, had, we were talking about the spatial daylight autonomy something that was talking about how much daylight we have in how many area. Um, lead before um, kind of evolved through that and added one more thing, which is the glare. They now are talking about the visual comfort in a building as well to balance that daylight availability. And on top of that, we're talking about the views, providing the quality views for the occupants. Well, taking it another step further and telling us to use, for example, glass with VLT of 40% or higher to make sure that the occupants in there are getting that nice natural daylight that will support their circadian rhythm, that they will um, really enjoy it will be very helpful in a, in a space. So from here, let's take it one slide further um, and talk about how, how do we achieve that complex balance of great um, availability and daily and visual comfort. So the first one on the next slide would be, oh yeah, sorry for this slide. <laughs> um, so the first thing that comes to mind, right, is, is, is the window. We wanna talk, we wanna add the windows to get more daylight in our space, but more glazed area doesn't always mean better light. And it, we must always remember, well, first of all, what we talked about last month is the solar radiation, how much of that um, heat gains we want to get, how much of the um, heat we want to lose through the, through the glass because the U value of the glazing is way 
worth than the, uh, than the U value of the opaque wall. So not just that the daylight has to be balanced with the glare, it also has to be balanced with the thermal comfort and the energy performance of the building, not to complicate it too much. So now let's go to the next slide and talk about the, the strategies, right? That uh, that can get that quality daylight in there without compromising thermal comfort and energy performance. So the one way is the side lighting, our vertical glazing on a facade. Um, so the rule of thumb, if how much daylight you're going to get through the windows is really depend. It depends on your uh, on your location, on the orientation of the window, on the TVs of the glass, on the context that you have around your building. Is it an urban area? You don't have any, let's say, buildings or vegetations around. But the typical rule of thumb is that um, if you not have a heavy shading, your daylight is gonna go as far as twice the height of the window head uh, deeper into the space. Now with that, um, it is kind of obvious we, that maybe we don't need to provide the whole kind of stripe window to get the daylight further, right? It's just only going to create the perimeters on brighter. What we really want to think about is how, how tall is that window so we can get the daylight deeper into the space to let those, let's say, people in an office who are sitting more in the core, get them the daylight as well. That also tells us that maybe that um, window cell um, is not that beneficial for us as well. Maybe we do not want to provide that floor to ceiling glass and we want to have that at least a little bit of seal on the bottom, um, improve our energy performance, don't let that much solar heat gains so while still allowing the views, while still allowing the daylight. Um, and then here we, we're talking about the unilateral and bilateral. Um, daylight, obviously the bilateral one, if your floor plate allows, will create a little bit more, will kind of sum up a little bit more daylight. Um, but you have to be careful about that when you have the two windows in a corner, which can create a little bit more of the overlet or excessive daylight. So that's the side light. Let's go to the next slide. I'm talking about the top light, which is another great way to provide the daylight into the space, especially if we're talking about the deeper floor plates or the more wider, bigger space, um, where the, the daylight from the from the vertical win windows cannot reach that that middle, and we still want to provide the nicely daylight um, space in there as well. So there's a lot of different ways to create the, the top light. We can talk about the skylights. Um, we can talk about the clear stories. Um, again, you, you can see some rule of thumbs in here, how far in the space you, you want to put them. It all kind of goes from that rule of thumb that the vertical um, window will put it kind of twice, so one and a half height of the window. So that's kind of where you want to start putting your uh, your skylights. Important thing to consider in here is that first the, the glazing that is horizontal um, is going to allow way more solar heat gains than the vertical glass. So the amount of skylight really has to be balanced. You don't want to provide more skylight that you need. Otherwise, it's going to have really big impacts on your thermal performance and on, on your energy performance as well as thermal comfort. Uh, in the case of the Clary stories or kind of the uh, the sawtooth shaped uh, skylights, we want to talk about, we want to think about the orientation. So the northern light, for example, when we don't have any direct, direct daylight is the perfect orientation for that kind of um, skylight because it, it can provide that nice diffused light into the space and you don't need to think about extra exterior shading. You don't need to think about any, any glare or anything like that. And the on the next slide, we're going to see our last, last resort. What if we um, have that deep floor plate, but we cannot provide the skylights? What if we need that extra light, but we don't want to provide more um, the daylight in deeper into the space, but we don't want to make bigger windows? The light shelf, or to generalize it, reflecting the light deeper in, into the space is um, the great strategy. So. This kind of light shelf that's shown in here can work as both. 
a shading, which is the part on the exterior in there, which we do not see, that kind of blocks the daylight um, from the window below where let's say we can have some workstation and allows the daylight above, which is going to be reflected to the ceiling deeper into the space. If that light shelf is going to be paired with a high reflective ceiling, um, let's say it's white or glossy, um, it's going to be working even better. The light is going to go even deeper and you have the diffused uniform daylight throughout your space. So with that, since we started the topic of materials, let's, oh no, actually, sorry about that. <laughs> let's talk about how the daylight is measured. Um, what are the threshold and how, um, what are we working with when we're talking about the daylight? Um, so next slide. Um, when we're talking about daylight, we're really, well, the light, we're talking about three things. So we're talking about solar heat gains, and that's what we talked about last month. Uh, that is that heat component, um, solar radiation, that um, it's kind of separate from today's topic. So we remember about it, but we're not going to be talking about it today. Um, another component of the daylight is the illuminance. And that is the amount of light that falls on certain surface. Um, that is um, amount of light that LEED, for example, is interested in, and we are trying to achieve this certain amount of daylight on your workstation on, or on your classroom desk or on your lounge area. And then we're talking about the visual comfort, and in here the metric is luminance, and that is amount of light that is emitted by the certain source. It's not what's fall on the surface, but actual actual source of light. And it doesn't necessarily have to be the, the source. It doesn't have to be the sun. It doesn't have to be the light. It can be the light reflected from a certain surface. And we're going to see it in a, in a few slides. But let's let's skip to another one. Yeah, so let's talk about the illuminance. Um, as I said, illuminance is the light that um, falls on certain surface. Um, the quantity of light falling on a surface in lumens per square unit of the area. Um, it can be measured food candles, it can be measured at lux, um, usually in all the daylight analysis studies you would see the results in the lux, all the metrics that uh, we're going to be talking about a little bit later uh, when we're talking about the spatial daylight autonomy or UDI and things like that, they, they usually talk about lux. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, and so for example, the, uh, the lighting handbook, uh, the, which is a great source uh, of um, kind of those values that you wanna achieve, the daylight levels that you wanna achieve on your different programs, references luxes. So in here, working with daylight, we're actually referencing the lighting handbook as our best source to understand what kind of lighting levels, what kind of lighting conditions we want to achieve without daylight, without, or like maybe to supplement the electric light or just 100% daylight, right? So it's important to understand that different programs and different buildings and different spaces in your building will need different levels of illuminance. Um, our typical office, um, you want to achieve something between 300 and 3000. In the lounge, for example, we can go a little bit higher and your kind of max level can reach 5000, 7000. Um, but if we're talking about car parks or um, what do we have in here, the storage rooms and garages, um, bedrooms, we can only provide 50 lux and that is going to be sufficient because we're not really um, no one is expected to do any writing or, or reading tasks in there. Um, so definitely really great resource if you're not sure what exactly to do and what exactly to aim for in, in a certain rooms in a certain buildings. Okay, let's move forward in here. Yeah, now we're talking about luminance. So luminance, as I said, is how much of the daylight um, is emitted by a certain source or a certain surface. Um, it is an apparent brightness. And luminance is usually used to define the, um, the visual comfort and kind of the, the brightness. It's also used to define how bright is the, the display, for example, of the computer. 
let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, and in here you can see what the actual difference of, of the luminance and you can understand how to, when you see your results on the studies, how to, where to put them. So for example, your fluorescent lamp, it's gonna have the luminance of 6,000 to 8,000 8, while the, um, the direct sunlight on the snow is about 25,000. So um, kind of seeing that the difference, right, is, um, is interesting. It's also important to understand that um, luminance not 100% define the glare. The glare is defined by other conditions as well. It's what is your context. Um, it defines by the contracts and it's by the con contrast. And I think Dan is gonna be covering it a little bit later so we can move forward. Yeah, and finally, so we talked about our daylight sources so where the light is coming from. Now we talk about how, what are our materials and other kind of how our building is actually interact with that. So let's go straight into that. Um, first, we'll talk about the opaque materials. And it's not just the, the envelope that blocks the light, it's also the materials that are inside your building, inside your space where you're trying to create the quality daylight. Um, by defining the materials in, in that interior space or on your louvers or off your um, envelope, you can actually define how, um, how diffuse the light is going to be, how bright the light inside is going to be, how far it's going to uh, reflect inside the space. So all the materials have certain reflectance properties. Uh, in the majority of your daylight analysis, you will see um, the diffuse reflectance. And that is going to depend on how bright um, your your material is. So for example, the generic interior floor is 20%. The generic ceiling is 80 because it's usually white. You can go to 90 by making it glossy. But then uh, there's also specular reflectance. And the specular reflectance is more like mirror reflectance. And that is something that is really important to take into account to make sure that we're not gonna have any glary condition in a space. So um, the example that I had in my practice was that academic building that um, in outside of their classrooms and their classroom windows, they, um, they provided those metal vertical louvers. And um, they were really concerned that those metal louvers are gonna have that mirror effect that is gonna cause glare for uh, those classroom desks. So um, you really have, what we did, we basically defined that specular uh, reflectivity based on a cut sheet that was provided by the manufacturer of the louver and then see how much of that mirror effect actually is gonna happen. So um, it's important to keep it in mind that those glossy, um, products or certain materials can, can cause that. But the diffuse reflectance is something that we can use in our benefit. Again, like a high reflective ceiling, like um, a white, wind, white walls, they can just keep bouncing the light um, back and forth and make sure that and kind of create that uniform daily space. Let's move forward. Yeah, so those were our opaque materials. And now the last thing in here is the glass materials, what actually allows the daylight into the space. As we talked in the last uh, session last month, um, the window itself will protect um, or like block or reflect some portion of the heat gains in the window, uh, that solar heat gain coefficient of the glass. So the window is gonna do exactly the same with the light component as well. As well. Um, VLT or visual light transmittance. It's also sometimes called TVs. It can have some other names. I've seen so many different abbreviations. Um, we'll uh, really define how much of that light is gonna go into the space and how much of that is gonna be reflected. Um, and in here, it is really important to understand what kind of glass we are, what kind of windows or curtain walls or glass we are working with from the very beginning because um, we cannot always achieve 90% TVs and we probably don't want to. If we're talking about the triple glass that we need to achieve our energy performance goals, 
you really cannot go above 60 VLT um, just because of all the coatings and, and other things that goes into this window. Um, and it's, it's important to understand that it's okay. <laughs> it's gonna be enough daylight. You can go as low as TVs 40 and 30 and um, the, the naked eye inside the, inside the space, if you're looking outside from that 30 and 40 TVs glass, you're not gonna see the difference. It's not gonna look murky or dark. Um, it's still gonna be quality views and quality daylight. Well puts threshold on VLT 40, um, which is how they <laughs> kind of define that natural, um, natural light and how, how much of the daylight you can get. So definitely what, if one thing I, I, I want to say in here is that don't be afraid of, of lower TVs. It's, it's, your, um, it's your tool to get to the quality daylight. And then the last slide before I turn it to um, turn on the next section, because I'm already taking too much time, is to just sum it all up. What exactly I we're working on in here is um, to understand when you're working with your daylight, you're working with your outdoor, with your external sources such as daylight, you manipulate it with your facade and your envelope with your uh, with your fenestration, with your louvers, and then you also can manipulate it and you can kind of respond to that daylight inside with your materials, how glossy they are, do you have the light, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think that's where I'm going to turn it to Dan. Hello. <clears throat> Um, hi everybody. Uh, can I, can you, you switch me to, over to let me you want to take over sharing? Okay. I'll, I'll stop. Everybody seen my screen? Um, well, first thanks, uh, to the Cody group for having me. Um, I'm, I'm actually up in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, at Lamp Partners, and we have we have a couple folks working in the office, uh, actually in Philly now, and we've got some great projects happening in in Philly. So definitely some nice connections. Um, so today I'm gonna I'm gonna continue where um, Ksenia uh, sort of stepped off um, and look more specifically at how we simulate daylight and sort of the implications on those those different sort of workflow methodologies and a couple projects that sort of illustrate different ways in which we've taken advantage of the sort of the, the advent of the digital tools um, for daylighting analysis. Um, and really, uh, you know, you're probably all expecting to sort of jump in right based off of what Ksenia was talking about before, to, you know, the different metrics for analyzing daylight in, in digital space, but it's really worth starting with the, with the Heliodon because really up until well, I guess 10 years ago, um, and even still some, you know, occasionally today, we were doing all daylight analysis with a, with a physical, physical model on a Heliodon, which uh, I presume a number of you have experienced in one fashion or another, whether it was in school or in, in the workplace. And uh, sort of in um, sort of the, the late uh, 90s, 80s, 90s, um, our office was actually doing, um, quantitative analysis using this the Heliodon with sensors inside the model. This is the model on the left is actually from the Guggenheim and Bilbao um, Pittsburgh Convention Center in the middle. But now we're, you know, we've moved into into digital space. And now that we've got sort of graphics cards capable of providing us real time rendering, we're able, we've been able to sort of migrate our work to digital Heliodon. And there are some definite benefits to the analog, you know, especially when you're using it in real time and the feeling of being able to sort of manipulate models. But ultimately, you know, most often the, the work is being um, shown through through photography. So what you're seeing on the screen is is very real issue where, you know, the, the digital renderings are going to look more sort of quote unquote realistic. Um, and the reason for that is, is, you know, a whole series of algorithms running behind the scenes that that let us um, simulate daylight as, uh, pretty accurately at this point, uh, starting, starting at the, the core of ray tracing, 
um, dating all, all the way back to sort of the conceptual framework of Albrecht Durer back in the 1500s. Um, but, but even today, we're, you know, with, with rendering algorithms, not all are created equal. And many of you who may use Enscape or, or Lumion or other sort of um, commercial visualization engines may actually be not seeing sort of quite the real picture. Um, some, some of them are better than others. And so for our practice and, you know, for any sort of real lighting design work, you really need to be using a physically based rendering um, algorithm um, underlay. And, you know, lets us sort of do visualizations that give us a very high level degree of fidelity, material, sam material properties and, and um, whatnot for, for the visual um, qualitative assessment of, of the daylight qualities of a space. And we use that, you know, this is really our primary tool in a lot of ways. You know, the, we talk a lot about metrics and we're going to talk about a lot, lot about metrics throughout this presentation, but at the core, you know, we're, our practice is really about creating quality daylight space. And so using the visual analysis tools as, as much as possible to sort of forefront that and then backing up our claims with, with the quantitative is really where we, we find the most productivity. Um, Ksenia mentioned some stuff about materials. I'm not going to go too in depth here, but just note that, you know, obviously for all physical materials, there has to be sort of a digital, anal uh, digital analog, you know, sort of a similar. Um, most things are sort of rendered similarly to what's, what's called a plastic in, in radiance. Um, there are also metals and glass materials and various flavors of that based off of how smooth or rough the, the surface finishes are and, and complicated. If you, if you start getting really complicated, there's a, there's a whole subset of materials called bidirectional scattering distribution functions or BSDFs, which can um, basically approximate how a complex material transmits light through it. So good examples are um, some popular, more complex daylighting materials like um, uh, uh, Panelite is on the left and Ocalux is on the right. Um, Ksenia mentioned some stuff about, about uh, specular louvers. Um, so a BSDF function could sort of capture all that, that information into a single material that you could then study with. And thanks, Janky, for noting, yes, Radiance is sort of the core underlying open source program that, that does a lot of the computational work. Um, in a daylighting analysis, we also need to understand what the conditions of sun and sky are. And um, you know, earlier versions of this would have been, uh, or earlier versions of daylighting analysis might have used sort of just a generic clear sky or a, or a generic cloudy sky. Um, but these days, we're mostly relying on annual weather data. Um, the Energy Plus website that's run by the, the US government um, has basically an open source database for pretty much every publicly available um, typical meteorological year file available throughout the world today. A lot of them are created from weather stations at airports. Um, they get they have to get updated periodically and especially with climate change even increasingly quicker um, to account for the the thermal um, changes and in some places you know that's going to have impact on the amount of sky cover and solar access. Um, you know, it's in terms of it, pure daylighting design, it's not going to have, it doesn't have quite as big of an impact as um, energy performance design, but it definitely makes a difference. And so we really care about this sort of whole 8,760 hours throughout the year in, in our forthcoming analysis, which we'll talk about, but then we want to break that down into specific schedules. So when are people actually using the spaces? So if you're in a regular office space, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. has sort of merged as the default 10 hour period in which people tend to be in office space. If you're in a school, maybe that's 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. only during the fall, spring and fall, winter and spring. So all of this sort of connects together in what we call the daylight area. Um, in order to do this, run this analysis, you need to start with some sort of physical or some sort of digital architectural geometry and define a grid. Um, typically that grid is spaced about two feet on center, uh, about three feet above the floor, or two and a half feet above the floor with an occupancy schedule of 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. We'll get back into that in a minute. Um, and then I'll talk about the rest of it as, as we get to it. Um, many of you've probably seen or worked with these sort of snapshot points in time, the luminance levels. Um, so this, this 
you know, in, in sort of the early days of digital analysis, this was really the, the apex of being able to look at these snapshots in time and get a sense of how much daylight penetration you're getting. So in this sort of generic space in the summer, you're getting not very much daylight penetration in the winter, presuming that's a south facing window, you're getting a lot more daylight penetration. But that doesn't really tell you how daylit the space is. And it's hard to for humans to sort of generalize based off of all these pieces of information that we're seeing on the screen together. About 120 years ago, as an alternative to that practice, and almost, I guess, previous to point in time was was this concept of daylight factor, which was developed in England, which is a cloudy environment. And the idea was just let's just take the ratio of how much light we have inside to how much light we have outside. And that makes a lot of sense if you're in a cloudy condition, but it definitely doesn't make sense if you have direct sunlight, um, because you're going to sort of under under assume the direct sun penetration, you're going to fail to account for overlit zones near the windows and sort of you know all the sort of the nuance of the dynamic motion of the sun. So uh, about 20 odd years ago, um, some building scientists came up with ways of sort of compositing annual data um, into more meaningful metrics that could sort of be consolidated. And, and so these are generally termed annual climate-based metrics. And so we'll, I'm going to talk through each of these in succession and how they sort of build upon each other. And I'm not talking exhaustive, but these are sort of the most commonly used uh, flavors, as I like to call it. And the way I like to explain annual climate-based metrics is kind of similar to high-level mathematics and extra dimensions. Um, there's a great video on, on YouTube about vision, uh, uh, um, illustrating the 10 the 10 dimensions of space-time, and I highly suggest it. Um, but sort of in a similar way, we were taking sort of these, these baseline dimensions of annual climate data and for location and spatial geometry of, of your site-specific architecture. And you're overlaying that with sort of these layers of information. So we could take a single point in time in a single point of space, or I should say a single point of space at a single point of time. We can look at that same point in space, but over multiple times, or we could look at that single point in space over a whole year at all the times during a typical day, or we could look at all the points in a year at all the times of day. And that's really what we're trying to look at is this bottom one, but how do we collapse all that information into something that's meaningful to us? So the first and sort of most rudimentary version of that is daylight autonomy. And that basically just says at any given point in space, what percentage of the occupied hours are above a certain threshold. And 300 lux has emerged as that threshold. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Um, we take that one step further and say, of all of the points in this space, how many of those um, points are above, above 300 lux? And we, su we say that any space is considered daylight autonomous if that number is over 50%. We can also take that same data of, of basically taking illuminance measurements throughout the course of the year and say, if a certain amount of those points are more than a threshold, in this case, a thousand lux for more than 250 occupied hours, then, then that, sp that, um, that area is considered uh, sunlight exposed and this, metric, which some of you, who, anybody who's worked in LEED before has seen, is this metric is really intended as a proxy for glare potential. And I'm going to talk about glare potential in a little bit, but basically this is this this idea that you're getting more than a thousand lux on the task plane is not inherently a good or bad thing. It is contextualized by su suggesting that more than 250 occupied hours in which one's surface desk is over a thousand lux probably means that you're going to have glary conditions or overlit conditions and that anybody sitting within that area may have trouble with the sunlight exposure so those are a couple different metrics but the one that has emerged at least within the design the daylighting design community is one of the more robust is called useful daylight illuminance. And what this does is it sort of collapses the last ones that we just talked about with a little bit of additional 
flair. So instead of saying that 300 lux is your is your minimum, it's actually giving you partial credit for what the time between, or I'm sorry, luminous level between 100 and 300 lux. So that's basically saying that if at a given point in time, your that point is seeing 150 lux, it's going to give you a half a point instead of zero points. So it it boosts up supplemental daylight um, access. Conversely, it puts a top end threshold of 3000 lux, saying that anything above that would be considered potentially excessive and a, a potential glare condition or heat gain. Um, so I've, I personally end up using this, this metric a lot when I am designing and we can actually sort of collapse a couple different Piece, ways of presenting this data in a way that sort of tries to make it more meaningful for viewers, readers that are not, you know, so well versed in daylighting design. So this was a school I was working on that unfortunately got canceled, but I did the, this great graphic, so I'm using it. Um, looking at, you know, obviously I'm I'm showing a gra a graphic over the whole space, um, but I'm calling out a couple different spaces in particular, and so this classroom was I think north facing or maybe yeah north facing and so it was getting really good daylight in the afternoons um, with not quite you know maybe supplemental daylighting in the morning so that was a really good classroom space this corridor space was was seeing really good daylight through a lot of the year but then it was getting this excessive afternoon sun I guess maybe this was north I should have put a north arrow on here I'm sorry um, excuse me um, so this was an area where we were going to potentially add more some louvers or some other sort of external solar shading to minimize uh, the the, the overlighting and then this room here that seems to be either not enough daylight at all or only supplemental was actually the computer lab they didn't want too much daylight so that actually was working in their favor so basically by like by taking advantage of the the spatial organization of the graphic on the right plus the sort of the yearly histograms that you see on the left we're able to tell a pretty robust story about the quality of the daylight in these spaces. So a lot of people ask me why these numbers exist the way I do. And luckily, I have a good answer because I actually co-wrote a paper with Christoph Reinhardt when I was in grad school. And then we wrote a second follow-up paper where we literally compared the uh, perceptions of people to the metrics and tried to correlate sort of wh what was going on. So the way in which we did this was we had uh, students, admittedly, at uh, Harvard Graduate School of Design, admittedly, um, go into the Carpenter Center, which is a you know relatively well-known building by Le Corbusier, um, and we used the second floor studio space and had st every student fill out an 11 by 17 survey where they had to draw their perception of the daylit area. And then in this version, we had them also measure illuminance levels with a light meter, but that ultimately didn't serve to be nearly as interesting. So then we core, um, you know, found the mean line between all of theirs. Obviously, there's a lot of discrepancy here, but you know, there's still there still was a, a, a mean line that converged. And then we compared that to all the rules of thumb. So Ksenia mentioned the two two window height rule of thumb. Yeah, it's it it it's in there sort of, but it's actually pretty far off in this case. Uh, the two percent daylight factor very much under uh, represented where people perceived that limit to be. Uh, this was written in two thousand eleven, so the old lead criteria was was then two hundred fifty lux uh, at both nine a.m. and three p.m. on September twenty first, and that that got closer, but was still kind of far off. But lo and behold, daylight autonomy of 300 lux, 50%, was the closest. And at the time, the the current use, useful daylight illuminance metric did not exist, so we didn't um, test that one. But this basically shows that you know there was there's a pretty close correlation. I think it was only a four percent deviation um, between this daylight autonomy line and how people perceived the daylight area. So arguably. You know the the outcome of this is that you know when we're using this metric, we're really using it as a proxy for how do humans perceive interior architectural space to be daylit or not. Um, we then went on to do a second study where we uh, 
uh, tried to get as many architecture schools throughout the world to replicate our study as, as best as possible. We ended up with 11 and um, we did introduce this sort of the, the, the um, partially daylit area in this and long story short, it, cor it, it correlates, it, it upholds the, the, the concepts we, talk, we found in the first one. Um, so you can rest assured that at least at a high level, these metrics are intended to match human perception. That leaves glare. And glare is where things get a lot more complicated because glare is not easily met, uh, modeled or uh, measured by a single point in space and time. It, it really is a view dependent uh, concern. As Consenia mentioned, it's luminance based, which means it's, it's point of view and location based. Um, so th the first round of glare potential uh, digital simulations really focused on a point in time at a, at a specific point in space where you may be able to move your view around and it'll show you sort of whether or not that view has imperceptible or has has glare based off of the the daylight glare probability, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. Um, but you know that that also has limited utility because you know you stick yourself in one point of view and it might be okay, but you move your head two feet over and all of a sudden it's not okay anymore. So the background on glare is that, like I mentioned, it's complicated. It requires some calculus, which I don't pretend to fully understand what's going on in the mathematics on the bottom left. But I think the, there are a couple important features and I, li I like putting this up here, not only to just scare everybody a little into about glare and sort of, you know, make it real, bring it, bring it down to reality, but also, the, you know, one of the most important factors here is what's called the goose position index. And that's what this, this image up here is. So imagine this image is your eyeball and this is you looking outwards. So these bands up here are your, is basically your eyebrows. So you get from a, a uh, let's see, I think this is in the new, the denominator. Um, so basically one is huge, right? If you've got a glare source right in front of you, you're gonna have a really glary experience. But if, you're, if, if that glare source moves to up above your forehead, that, that number is dropped precipitously down to 15.5. So basically this shows you sort of spatially where glare sources are going to be more likely, which obviously can have a pretty big impact on whether or not an air a space is, or a particular point in space and point of view is, is gonna be perceived as glary. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, daylight glare probability, single point in space. Um, the wonderful folks at Salema, which is the company that started Diva, which I just to, Put it on the table. I'm part of the executive user group, or I can't remember what they call it now, of Climate Studio, which is their new software. They have developed a new um, metric that they call spatial visual discomfort. Um, and basically, the intent of this is to try and explore the total potential of glare throughout a whole space using not a point source, not a not a grid point looking straight up, but a series of grid points. Uh, aiming out in a in a circle. So each one of these wedges that you see in their graphic actually relates to one viewpoint looking around in a circle. And in this case, there's eight of them, but in the program, you can adjust how many of those um, views you, you would see. And you can then look at that throughout the you know course of the day or the whole year. Um, so uh, in this case, basically, you know, red, yellow shows if you're, if the, you might have some perceptible glare, orange if it's disturbing and red if it's intolerable. So down here at the bottom, you can see that like, if you're sitting at this point right here and looking to the right, you're having a in, potentially intolerable glare situation for at least 5% of occupied hours, which doesn't sound like a lot, but imagine that if you are sitting in a, in a desk that you're required to sit at because that's your cubicle and you're having intolerable glare for at least 5% of your working hours. Well, that's what, that's like upwards of like 200 or 300 hours, which from a productivity standpoint can be huge. So uh, a case study for, for how this um, metric was used in, in, in the wild was a lead project that I worked on where I, I started, I actually did a lot of um, sort of 
pinpointed analyses during the design process, you know, testing if their light shelf was going to work out and if it was worth spending money on, how big the outriggers for uh, for overhangs needed to be, whether or not we're going to do sloping ceilings, reflectances of materials. So I did a whole series of those um, des design studies, which I'm not going to show you here. What was most interesting was that the building was really going for a very high level. They're going for platinum. And this was from a company that's done other buildings in other parts of the world, not in the United States, where they don't use any um, shading in the office spaces and they just do really good daylighting design and as you can see if you look closely here that we actually pulled the uh, the the office desks back five feet away from the windows so that they wouldn't be smack up against the windows so we could actually reduce our regularly occupied zone from from the windows and we were getting really you know pretty good daylighting overall um, you know was it could have been a little better but you know so is everything in life. But the, the issue that we ended up with was um, with uh, uh, this interesting prerequisite that actually demanded glare control devices for all um, regularly occupied spaces. Um, so basically the idea is like, you wanna be able to give occupants control over their own environment. And so from a conceptual standpoint, I don't necessarily agree with where we landed on this, but but you know, such is the work of a consultant, right? So what we, we ended up doing is proving through, by using this glare analysis that Climate Studio offered, um, basically I showed that only a handful of desks would have potentially glary conditions. And the architecture and interior design were able to sort of adjust the desk orientations to minimize this. Um, note that that I had two wedges for each desk, but you know, obviously the bottom desk here doesn't count because they were actually looking at their screen. You might argue that there might be some reflection on the screen that could be an issue, so that's not something to discount. Um, but the upshot is like, you know, if they can just deal with these two desks, desk cubicles at the corners of their building, or maybe there's trees out front. Um, like I note here, there are trees out here, but LEED doesn't demand that we include them, so we didn't include them. Um, the upshot was we were able to make this case and LEED accepted this as an alternative path of compliance. So for future reference, you can use the glare analysis to, to um, comply with LEED in sort of non-traditional ways. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to change gears and run through this one last case study that is sort of my passion daylighting project um, from my recent career um, that uh, employed a whole slew of different um, analyses um, in our in the process. So this is a story about control. It is questionably about sustainability, although the um, methodology I hope could be used for more sustainable practices. But at the end of the day, this was for a very wealthy university that just wanted to amend a bad decision that they made. And we'll get into what that is. So Princeton Firestone Library, named after Harvey Firestone of the tire company, um, had this uh, existing skylit atrium space that connected the old building that was built in the 30s to a newer stacks area that was constructed in the 1980s. And the existing space had been used as a reading room um, and included this, this louvered, um, or sorry, brisole underneath the glazing that gave you about a 7% visual light transmission through um, that whole um, assembly. And the architects wanted to sort of maintain this very pristine environment. They had worked with some glitzy designer to, to select these lighting fixtures. We had nothing to do with that. Um, but the issue was that, you know, when we did an initial analysis of the amount of daylight um, at sort of a worst case scenario, we're getting, you know, well over 3000 lux. Um, and that was obviously gonna be an issue for conservation because if I hadn't mentioned already, this had been decided by the um, university to turn this room into the rare books reading room, which for anybody who's done any conservation work, that's a terrible idea, but here we were. So the first idea that we put on the table was to sort of do the more traditional uh, daylighting design moves, which would be to block off the middle cells of the glazing, keep the glass 
clear next to the um, old facade to wash that wall, add baffles on the north side to pick up the, the late afternoon sun and bisect that. And we, um, you know, it wasn't, it's it's not necessarily like an architecturally, most architecturally appealing start, but it was, it certainly did the trick, at, at least from our perspective, except for one issue um, and the issue of lux hours. So we had basically been given this uh, directive to use three, 300 lux, I'm sorry, 500 lux as our maximum illuminance level that we should be achieving in that space at any point in time. And we were like, but no, you know, r rare books accumulate, uh, um, have trouble with light over time. It's not just instantaneous amounts of light. Um, so, you know, just by minimizing the amount of time that the books are out in the summer or, you know, having some sort of local shading for, for the texts would might be a, a, a better way of handling it. And they're like, no, 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 most of the researchers work during the summertime. We got, we got to mi minimize, you know, keep it 500 bucks. So we're, you know, sort of scratching our heads, like banging them against the table, trying to figure out what, what are we going to do with this 500 lux? Because the issue that we kept running into as we got into our second iteration was basically in order to make the light levels low enough for conservation in the summer, it meant basically blackening out the space so that the, the winter time would be super gloomy and it would feel like you're in a, enclosed space with no real access to, to sunlight and daylight. And, you know, so we did all the, you know, requisite metric studies to, to support this. It was just too, too dark and gloomy. And, you know, we were just like, there's got to be a better way. And in fact, there was. Um, in, our, in one of our iterations, we sort of threw out the idea of electrochromic glass, not thinking it would stick because at the time it was new, only one manufacturer had had a workable, a viable product on the market, Sage Glass. But um, the architect took the client to visit a couple of buildings and before we knew it, they had bought into this idea of using uh, electrochromic glass. So for the uninitiated, uninitiated uh, electrochromic glazing uses a very low electric charge to add or remove a, a tint within an interlayer of the glazing assembly to go from a clear state, so whatever the glass transmission is, usually around 60% at clear, all the way down to one, or now a couple companies are even doing down to 0.1% uh, visual light transmission. Um, and then they make intermediary steps at what is perceived by the human eye as midpoints. So 60% down to 18%, is, is about a 50% reduction in, in light levels according to the human eye. Drop to 6% gives you another uh, halving of that and then 1% again. And that sort of follows a logarithmic curve if you, if you think about it. Um, so the first thing we had to do obviously was test to make sure that that 1% in the middle of the summer would, would do the work and uh, it did. Um, we found that you know our direct sun was, was shaded correctly and so it worked and we didn't really care about the early mornings here. And um, we just had to, you know, pay attention a little in the late afternoons. Um, but then it becomes the question of control, because in a, you know, in a sky, in a single skylight application or in a vertical glazing application, you have the potential to sort of band that very um, uh, with a very sort of straightforward reasoning, right? The higher bands get darker, and then they band as they get lower. But you know, we didn't have that opportunity, and I had long had this fascination with heliotropism and the idea of you know plants that sort of follow the sun. So, um, and we had these sort of 900 cells of glazing to work with, and so I came up with this grasshopper script that that basically just follows the sun, right? Whenever the um, sun bisected a piece of glazing that the the sun ray hit the task plane, it would turn to the darkest tint and then came up with some um, a methodology where in sort of low low end, sun that was hitting sort of the lower walls would would translate the the glass to six percent hitting the upper walls would translate it to 18 percent and if it was hitting the upper the super high wall or not coming through the glass at all then it would just remain clear and that works conceptually and arguably it probably would have worked in our case in the long run as well but the um you know, this algorithm did not account for the 
actual illuminance levels at any given point in time. And the we also got some feedback that this so this was a little jumpy, um, you know, the shapes of the of the glass. So we went back and sort of reiterated. So where we landed was um, using some more sophisticated algorithms to calculate uh, using a radiance um, a radiance calculation for every single time step for every single possible iteration basically came up with uh, somewhere on the order of like 350 different individual scenes um, where we where landed was one addition one scene for every day but you could use the same scene for about two weeks worth of time because the sun moves much faster across the sky during the day than it does throughout the year. So we were able to use that one scene for a couple of weeks. And then for each point in time, there would be four different uh, weather um, possibilities from fully sunny to fully cloudy. And there's a, um, a series of, of sensors on the roof that, that basically watch the sky and, and change this. So I was able to pull this raw data out of the the algorithm in Grasshopper that I built, and we gave that directly to the manufacturer who used this to program the skylights directly. Um, so this was the digital rendered version of sort of where we landed, sped up very quickly, um, and this is what it looks like in in real life. So it 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 all sort of went very smoothly. Um, until sort of the next uh, spring or no, I'm sorry, until the next summer when we got a couple complaints that at like a certain point of time and a certain point of space, they were getting some direct sun. So I had them draw in on, on a, on a um, sheet of paper similar to that, that daylight area analysis, had them draw where they saw the, the, the direct sun and sent me some pictures and we just adjusted the, the algorithm a little and uh, haven't heard anything since. So uh, that was ultimately like the, one of the most interesting daylighting projects I've ever worked on in my life and, and sort of employed all these very sort of unique ways of, of taking advantage of all these digital tools that we've talked about throughout the whole um, evening here. So with that, uh, I complete and uh, open the floor for questions. I can't hear anybody. All right, Dan, I, I was still muted. Um, there is, um, I don't know if it's a question, Jonathan, but I did find it kind of interesting, so I'll just share it here. Um, so Jonathan's wondering, is that why athletes put dark marks under their eyes to reduce the glare reflection oh, sure. from that 2.5 um, goose area? Like, that's a really interesting um, deduction there. That That is precisely why they do that, yeah. I mean, this, that's, that's it. Yeah, that's really awesome. Okay, so we are getting some questions in here. Um, so there, one question from Abby is, she's wondering if there is an effective way to capture the shading effect of trees and vegetation surrounding a building. Um, how, in that project that you showed um, for the glare, how did you take uh, trees and vegetation into account? Yeah, so th that's a really interesting question. There's been, um, some interesting developments on that front in, from the modeling perspective and some work by Alston Jakubiak and his, his students. Um, I think he's at Daniels in Toronto now. Um, they've done some work looking at uh, sort of how to model trees uh, act relatively accurately, but with low geometry, because obviously like using a lot of leaves like you see in you know, other digital rendering um, can be very computationally expensive. Um, the truth is that LEED and LM83, which is the, the uh, IES directive that LEED is based on, actually lets you omit trees, which is not a very realistic, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, that seems like a pretty big externality. It's something that's come up a lot in, in daylighting uh, metric conversations. So, but I think within the next couple of years, there's going to be more tools for including trees and have those trees based off of whether you specify deciduous or coniferous um, would be able to either hold onto their leaves 
in the winter of the of the computational cycle uh, or or keep them. Thanks, Dan. Um, so Jonathan's asking a question that I had in my mind. Um, so this last example was awesome and it was like really in depth, but um, it might not be something that firms on the call today might be able to do in house. So how oh, you hire you me? <laughs> well, how would you um, define that breaking point? At yeah, which yeah. point where you would do things in house versus hiring a consultant? Well, I mean, I I'll start by saying that like, part of me wishes that I worked as an architect and in an architecture firm instead of as a consultant, because you guys are really the ones in the hot seat to make all the important decisions early in the design process. Um, so using analytical tools early in your form making, early when you're trying to develop your window to wall ratios and your, your facade assemblies, running some quick studies that gives you some design feedback you know super a super simple model where you st where you're where you're testing a couple different very or maybe one variable at a time and testing a couple different conditions can give you a lot of feedback information to help you make better design decisions um, that doesn't require go, you know a super in-depth uh, set of analysis I think the, the 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 single most important piece of advice I can give you is, these metrics and any analysis doesn't exist in a vacuum. You really want to be doing analysis where you're studying, where you're testing at least two or three different um, iterations or variants, so that you have something to compare against. Because you know, if you're just looking at, you know, you like you like this one window pattern, and you get a certain, uh, you know. Um, a result from the analysis program. Well, that's that that number. Yeah, you can um, compare it to you know the benchmarks of of lead more generally, or you know, or or chips or well or whatever you're sort of working with. but ultimately, you really want to have some sort of way of looking at that within 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 the design process. And I mean, speaking to architects, that should should be shouldn't be anything new. Is that answer your question? Yeah, Ksenia, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Okay. Oh, double muted, sorry. <laughs> I think that was it. Okay, great, awesome. Um, so that's the only questions I have here, but if anyone hasn't had a chance to type in something or if you're on your phone or your iPad and you wanna ask any questions, um, feel I free to unmute have... and ask. Um, what was the cool tool where the light rays were coming through and colored um, in the the atrium example? Oh, that was not a tool. That wasn't a tool per se. It was a uh, that was a visualization I made from the grasshopper definition that I created to do the, that project's analysis. So it was a custom script that I built. Okay. Um, but if you if you know a little bit of grasshopper, it basically is connecting a, uh, a a solar tool that that spits out a solar vector uh, with a surface and a, a bisecting here you know surface and it's you know it's it's very basic okay. vector math no big deal <laughs> yeah <It's... laughs> thanks could you elaborate a little bit more about concerns with tools like Inscape and Lumion? Mm, yeah, definitely. I can wax philosophical on this one for a while, because you know, we're, as a consultant, we are we see all the time where an architect comes to us and is like, "We want the build, we want it to feel like this," and it's like, "Well, your 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 ceiling is magically glowing from an invis from a series of invisible light sources that you have no interest in including in your project." So we have to start somewhere else. The one of the biggest problems that we run into is this is the issue of fill light and and the fact that you know the the those softwares which are designed for you know architectural representation are you know basically faking the lighting to to achieve a visual effect to sell to the client and we've we've run into some issues with this where you know the client has expectations that are not in line with the the modeling that we do and then after the project is built they're like but wait it doesn't look like the renderings. It's like, well, it looks like our renderings. 
and we show them to our client, the architect. So, you know, the, you have to be very, you have to take that, that all with a grain of salt, basically, you know, the, the, with, with daylighting, the, uh, you know, so, some of those simulators have gotten pretty good. And I, I imagine that within the next couple of years, we're probably going to get to the point where they are, they, or they can be visually accurate, but, you know, there's a lot of Photoshopping that also happens on behind the scenes. Any more questions from anyone? No. I, I want to make one last point also that, yeah, you know, sure. at the end of the day, garbage in, garbage out. You, you know, the tools have gotten a lot easier to use. They've gotten a lot more user friendly. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, settings that are, don't require the user to adjust as much, but on the other hand, you know, it's helpful to really un have a intuitive understanding of what some of those settings are, um, because if something's not working right, you know, you, you you need to be able to catch it. It's it's very very often that we do our own internal modeling where we find that, you know, somebody mis mistook a, a zero or used the wrong IS file for an electric lighting simulation or w what have you. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day. You know, these are models that are trying to simulate reality. They're not, they're not real. Marjorie, you had your hand raised. Did you have a question? I do, and I was trying to figure out how to get my um, the visual to come back on, but I can't. But thank you very much for noticing. Um, I do know the Firestone Library. I happen to have grown up in Princeton, so I remember it through oh, nice. the years. Yeah, and um, but so one of the, it's just a fundamental question in design where. It sounds like you were brought in late into the project, but I also wonder when initially they were addressing having the rare books there, it inherently doesn't want to be in the atrium light filled space. Was, I mean, <laughs> that yeah, kind no of, shit. <laughs> yeah, I know. Thank you. For, and I love to swear, but thank you for saying it that way. But I, this is, I've met with clients who in the beginning of the project, they tell me what they want to do. And I'm thinking about it. What they're really doing is sharing the problem and our role as we're all designers, architects, lighting designers, consultants, all of it is to take all of that criteria and solve it. It's if they, if it was, if it were just as simple as the client saying, we want to do this, then they actually just need a builder. <laughs> so our job is thinking about it, but so many thoughts came to mind. Um, you as a consultant, I remember many, many years ago, we always met with our consultants at the beginning of a project. And it, throughout the years when things got computerized and things were just emailed, those initial design meetings with all consultants, HVAC was done after the building's design and then it was just fitting it in. Same thing with, because such an initial premise would be working, the lighting design is integral to that solution, of course. I know you, we all know this, <laughs> but when I, when I see your whole presentation, it just inspires me thinking, but we're inherently supposed to be doing all of that. But it, it also means integrating with the consultants at the very beginning <laughs> in all along the way. And then before I forget, I couldn't figure out and this, pardon me for this, um, was the glazing actually that kind of glass that changes or not? Yeah. Was that ultimately used? It oh, was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And would you have used that if you were working on the project from the beginning? Well, it, you know, with this, this project is, a, is, is very peculiar and I really am not sure because, you know, those types of decisions, first of all, you know, we came into, they- Late. Well, late, but also like late in the planning process too. Like they had done the master planning for that library years before, right? Right. And this right. was already like fourth phase of the library's renovation. So they had long planned this intentionally. And I have no idea who the lighting designer was for the rest of the project, but I think they were more boutique out of New York and were, you know, not had no sort of inkling of doing sort of any real daylighting work. And I, I have no <laughs> idea how that, that it, science behind it. That whole project, I would say that Literally. whole project shouldn't have happened, but it did. <laughs> I, I, I love how frank you are. I mean, I'm, and, I'm, and I don't mind what I'm sharing is I've been in the field and in for a long time. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm getting jaded because this never should have happened. Like yeah. how did that happen? Right. So, the, but um, thank you for your transparency and saying it that way. It's interesting. And the other thing is, and I enjoyed the first presenter as well, because we all just, 
it reminds me I had um, happened to have gone to Yale University. I was taught a separate lighting course, but I remember the professor saying it's not quantity, it's quality in one of the slides. Of course, we have Ronchamp, but is also the Pantheon. <laughs> Think about that small Oculus and then how illuminated this entire thing is. So, Which is about 8% of the ceiling it, area. For, and and for it reference. is well lit, yeah. you know, for all the details. So that is such a, for just understanding light. Um, I was, anyway, so many things just come to mind. I, I, I do want to put, put one other comment on the table based on what you just said, you know, I, arguably the most uh, uh, rewarding moments in, in my professional career are actually when we get to have those kickoff conversations with our architect client where we're helping to sort of figure out what the building wants to be at, at a high level what, using daylight. What, and what that, can shape, be, that can be that can be a small the building is. Say what again? the whole shape of the project yeah. in figuratively and literally. Yeah. So it's not just lighting, it's structural engineering too. The right. most phenomenal structures are solutions of all of those issues. That would be the lighting. I know. And so I that's morphed over the years, but it's good. So remember when you uh, you even said, well, you know, hire the consultant, but it could really be in pieces at the beginning of a project too. So that it you really do get the stellar design and not just keep things fit in and then accommodated right. <laughs> and then and then accommodated which we see um think about the Beinecke rare book and manuscript library that's one of the ultimate rare book libraries and the whole solution it is skin Rowings and <laughs> Merrill and the whole solution so it's a structural solution but it's also about um controlled daylight mm -hmm. and it's very artistic as well I mean it's the absolute materiality you know and translucency of that material solving the problem not with just light fixtures put in at the end <laughs> sorry <laughs> you know what i'm talking about we saw it thank you for the presentation everybody too because it's really wonderful for the dialogue thanks and it makes you thank think you about all yeah it makes you makes you think about all of these things and it's integrated design really <laughs> thanks marjorie Thank you. Quick question for a quick question for Xenia. Um, I'm glad you brought up the the thresholds for you know luminance, for example. And I have a heck of a time um, putting those in context. And I wonder if you have any advice for um, you know, like ten thousand is a lot, two thousand is kind of a lot, three hundred is your screen, you know. Um, yeah. How do you no for sorry for luminance like the for brightness? Mm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, this thing. I love this thing. Yeah. Um, well, th that thing really. I think you really have to take it in context, right? In, in context of what's around you, what are other surfaces around you? Because if you have that black surface on a cloudy night compared to the fluorescent light, that's where you have that glare. But if um, you're within the range, as, as Dan was uh, explaining that glare um, concept, right? It, it's really not as straightforward as illuminance when we can just put those 300 to 3000 range on your office workstation and that's where you target. This one is, is a little bit more, it's a little bit more vague, I would say. Okay. I guess where I end up getting is that you just have to take my word that this is a pretty bright thing um, because it's it's hard to, you know, the eye is so adaptable um, that it's it's hard to get that reference. So like, you know, the sun is like completely off the charts, but to most people, I bet it's about as bright as a hundred watt bulb, for example, like oh, just intuitively. For, for what it's worth. So the, the new lead uh, lighting quality credit uses 7,000 candela per meter squared as their threshold for um, luminance limitation for electric lights. Um, and the way in which, the, where that's hard to sort of picture is if, if you think of a linear fixture that's one inch wide and it's putting out 500 lumens a foot versus that same 
length of fixture that but it's three three um inches wide the luminance of the three inch wide fixture at the same output is going to be a third of the luminance of the one inch wide fixture so the larger the aperture for the same amount of output is going to lower the brightness and conversely the higher the output and the smaller the aperture the higher the, the brightness but to Ksenia's point have it, your how bright something appears to you is very much a function of how that how that relates to its surround so anything that's more than a three to one ratio of brightness is going to you're, is going to be visible like you're gonna be able to tell that that's one thing's brighter than the other anything more than 10 to 1 is going to be like it, it, it to get glare eventually. so uh, this is just like the tip of the iceberg running glare as, as we yeah, it's really challenging hopefully that gives you a little context okay thanks thank you guys um so i think we're gonna end the session with a little bit on tools um you know our handy chart to kind of talk about the different tools that are used and we did um, survey the audience beforehand. So it does look like either the firms themselves or their consultants are using many of these um, softwares, except for light stanza. So I did want to, to kind of just highlight a couple of um, quick facts um, of the different tools out there. Really, there's only two softwares that can give you a report that is lead compliant and the two are light stanza or climate studio. Um, Diva, which is sunsetting um, and is being replaced by Climate Studio, was one of the other softwares that did meet the letter of the law for lead. I know that's something that um, a lot of people were interested in. And then we do have um, a bunch of other softwares. And I noticed that a lot of people are using Insight. So just one thing to mention about Insight is that it doesn't take into account context when it's doing a daylighting model. And that's not just like no trees, it's um, no buildings either as part of its daylighting study. It's just something to bear in mind when you're trying to evaluate what tool you wanna use for what. Um, uh, yeah, so the two free ones um, with a software, like a CAD BIM tool would be Insight is free if you get Revit um, and Pop, uh, Ladybug Tools is free with um, a Rhino uh, license in it. They pretty much all of these tools use Radiance, which is the engine that um, uh, simulates. It, it's a series of programs and co uh, scripts in the background. It's about like 10,000 programs that actually do all the calculations for the daylight simulations or for glare or your image-based renderings. Um, so, but how these programs interact with Radiance is what um, determines whether or not it meets lead or the level of accuracy that you're going to see with your daylight models. And so while a daylight study done in Insight might not be as um, accurate as say, for example, Cove tool or one of the like um, gold standards for lead compliance. Okay. And with that, um, our um, 2030 working group, I'm sorry, the 2030, whew, our coat group meets on third, the third Thursday of each month. Our next meeting is going to be July 22nd um, from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, we hope you can join us. And um, we do have a couple of subcommittees, and we're always looking for new volunteers. So um, you can subscribe to our calendar from our website and join any one of these meetings, which would be listed up there. Our meeting is actually on the 15th this month. Is it? Um, yeah, and I think the month maybe started early, <laughs> um, or uh, but we'll be meeting this Thursday. Um, Thanks, Bunny. So I hope you can join us. I just double checked my calendar and I, was, I must have it wrong. Um, thanks, Bunny. All right, thank you, everyone. Any last minute thank questions? You. I just wanted to thank uh, Ksenia and Dan again. Oh, yes. For thank great, you. Guys. Great presentation. Thanks. It's fantastic. <laughs> thank you, guys. Have a good evening, everybody. Have a good evening. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Thank you.